Hello everyone, today we're going to have a very exceptional episode of my program on whiskey because I am here with Miss Caroline Martin who will tell me all the secrets, or at least most of them hopefully, related to blending whiskey. Caroline is a member of the Diageo Johnny Walker blending team and she knows absolutely everything about a day-to-day -day work of a blender and I hope to know more about it right now. Caroline, hello, Hi. and I would say welcome, but I think it's maybe you who should, who should say welcome <laughs> because we are at Diageo Archives, a very, very unique place, so mm -hmm. thanks a lot for having me, uh, and thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me uh, and explain things that are related to your day-to-day -day work. Okay. I have to say that it doesn't happen very often that you meet a blender. Uh -huh. It's easy to meet people who want to talk to you about their personal feelings about taste, and flavor of whiskey, but not necessarily so easy mm -hmm. to talk to someone about the scientific side of it and practical side of it. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of questions for you. We don't have so much time, so I'll try to be quick. Mm -hmm. And so some things I wanted to ask you. One, one of the first things is that, you know, typically people think that uh, blenders, also people related to perfumes, they need to have some special, magical, genetic ability to distinguish three million different aromas and things yeah. like this. Can you tell us a little bit how much the blending, of the, blending the, the job of a blender, how much is it related to your uh, genetics and your physiological skills yeah. and how much can you learn actually? Uh, that's a really relevant question uh, and when we are recruiting new blenders to the team um, it's really, really important that we have a handle on how capable their sensory mm -hmm. uh, capability is, uh, and that is nosing and describing and tasting. Um, and everybody um, has, or more or less everybody has some capability, and it's our job to identify people who don't have that ability at all, because mm -hmm. that is a key skill for a blender. Mm -hmm. We don't expect uh, new people to the team to have an expert and finely tuned capability at that stage, but nonetheless they have to have um, an ability that we can train and uh, become more expert in mm -hmm. as they evolve and, and I've been here 32 mm -hmm. years and I'm still learning so it's it's does part it, of the job that interests Does it require uh, any sort of education, background education and do you have to be a biochemist or? Uh, well the, the team of blenders within Diageo, we have 13 of us and uh, we have very mixed backgrounds. Myself, mm -hmm. I have a, an arts degree in home economics mm -hmm. and I specialised in food science but we have chemists mm -hmm. uh, and so people from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I think what is important is you have that basic ability and then mm -hmm. through coaching in the team um, and just getting hands-on experience that will mm -hmm. improve over time. But some level of let's say inborn talent is necessary to do this not everybody could do this not everybody not everybody no, no. okay and so uh, as far as tasting is concerned uh, how important because you said you said also i, I also have sometimes problems with this yeah. uh, or it is a challenge maybe that's better put uh, how important it is uh, the ability to form your thoughts or your, the sensations that you feel yeah. to um, to translate them into words yeah. is that a separate skill because you, you mentioned this I think it definitely is and it's something that takes time to, to get there. Um, in my job I did train sensory panellists a while ago mm -hmm. um, and in some products it is much more simple to be able to define and describe the flavour styles that you pick up. Mm -hmm. So for flavoured products you know whether it's an apple or a mm -hmm. pear or a cherry that you've added to mm -hmm. um, a base spirit. When you come over to the whiskey side though, it is more difficult and mm -hmm. typically people will be able to pick up peaty or smoky notes. Mm -hmm. They may get a bit of sweetness in there or woody definitions, um, but the more subtle ways of describing mm -hmm. whiskies and what definitely pulls them apart uh, can take quite a bit of time to, to mm -hmm. fine tune. And so in between blenders, for instance, you and your colleagues, yeah. uh, if you're nosing the same whiskey mm -hmm. and you have the flavor wheel that probably is, is kind of like your, let's say, currency, yeah. different, uh, different uh, descriptors, yeah. the, the descriptive words that you use, do you usually agree on the words? Because it's easy to agree on fruity, it yeah. is. Yeah. But when you go, it's, it's apple, now it's per, it's peach, yes, yeah. but it's more like something else, <laughs> an apricot, whatever. Uh, do you usually agree on this or would you have arguments about I feel it's a little bit different? Yeah, I, I think really it depends on the sensory methodology and what the objective is of the exercise. 
if it is um, free choice profiling which allows us to describe things in, in our personal way then there could be a degree of overlap you'd like to think that would happen mm-hmm. um, but some people are more sensitive to some aromas and others are more sensitive to different ones mm-hmm. and that is the whole um, strength of our blending team is we appreciate and acknowledge who is particularly good at one mm-hmm. aroma and who we would ask to know for something else. So it's also it's also important to be self-critical um, and you also have to know where your place yes. is, which areas you're good at, which yeah. areas you might not be so good at. Yeah, yeah. What, what's your best area of expertise? Uh, I think that the strength of the team again is all about the diversity, mm-hmm. both from our backgrounds and our ability as blenders in our own right. Uh, I'm particularly sensitive to uh, sulfur compounds, mm-hmm. which you find typically more definitely in, more in, in new make spirit mm-hmm. than you do in mature spirit. So the mm-hmm. cask has its job to do to remove and change these sulfur compounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, on occasion, we may be able to pick up sulfur compounds in blended scotch or single malts. Mm-hmm. So that is an area that people know they, they come to me if they're in any doubt at all whether there's sulfur compounds in there. That so they would come to you and say, I think it's sulfur. Exactly. Can you confirm, Can you please? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Perfect. Um, so now getting back to your day to day job. Mm-hmm. So you come to the office, of course you have three coffees, very spicy food every day, things like this. No. Do, do, do you have any sort of, well, let's say, maybe not call it diet in terms of yeah. calories, yeah. but do you have any sort of things that you have to avoid for drinking, eating, yeah. or can you just go ahead and enjoy everything you want? Um, because myself, I've just have two, had two pounds of haggis for the breakfast. Oh, wow. Can I taste? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but that's why my, my jacket is unbuttoned. You know, <laughs> I think we've got to be very careful and we recognise what we should and shouldn't do. So Mm -hmm. some of the rules or guidelines round about um, before we come to do sensory work is that we should not come into the the whiskey lab or the blending room with perfume or aftershave. Of course. That's a definite no-no. Um, because although you're used to the aroma that that uh, evokes, then new people coming into the room pick up on that and it Mm -hmm. puts them off. I tend to personally steer away from uh, highly spicy food, curries, uh, strong coffee prior to nosing and tasting. Mm -hmm. Uh, The majority of what we do is by nose because Mm -hmm. your nose is very much more sensitive than your taste buds Mm -hmm. are. But at the end of the day, the consumer is going to taste these whiskies Mm -hmm. and you've got to have an appreciation and Mm -hmm. a judgment call on whether they are within specification Mm -hmm. or not. I think you've got to just be aware of if we're doing multiple samples as well, you can mm-hmm. get nose fatigue, mm-hmm. um, particularly if we're looking at peaty or smoky whiskies. Mm-hmm. And that self awareness is very much about okay, I've nosed five samples, uh, I'm now struggling to pick up character mm-hmm. in this sixth glass, just take a break. Mm-hmm. And have that um, skill to stand back and come back mm-hmm. and revisit these whiskies, mm-hmm. that's critically important. You can also get what's called carryover from one sample to another. Ah, okay. So you still feel something from the previous sample in the next one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the order of samples is Mm -hmm. important too. Mm -hmm. Uh, When we are nosing um, very light whiskies, like our grain whiskies in particular, um, and then we're going on a series of different malts we would manage the order of these samples in a mm-hmm. way such that you don't get the smoky characteristic coming over into lighter whiskies. Mm-hmm. And that's what I mean by carryover. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really important that you put your order your samples out in the correct order as well. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, this is a lot of things that you have to do. Yeah. And uh, now getting back to the tasting and nosing itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, from what I know and from what we spoke just a moment ago, I understand that at your work, nosing is more important than tasting. Is that correct? We, I think they're both important and it's both have their place in what we do. But what we do more often is nose the samples. So we nose individual cast samples of mm-hmm. grain and malt whiskies. Mm-hmm. Uh, we nose new make spirit as mm-hmm. well. And we can get a feeling of what the quality of these whiskies are like by nose mm-hmm. and then we subsequently go on and taste. Mm-hmm. But we may just taste when we have crafted prototypes or we've completed blends. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so the focus is very much more on, on nose. So how many samples can you nose per day, do you think? I mean, I mean, yeah. Not even yourself, just a, a blender yeah. in general. Again, every day is different and we can come into some nosing sessions where it may only be two or three glasses. Uh, other days it's very different and we're screening a whole lot of uh, individual cask malt samples, for mm -hmm. example, and we could put out a, a random array of 20 or 30 samples. Mm -hmm. But again, it's very important that people recognise when they are not detecting the mm -hmm. aromas and they stop and come back to mm -hmm. Okay, and so is there any, I would say, daily allowance or limit to how many samples? Because nosing, okay, nosing is only limited by, by your nose ability. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if the nose is overloaded, you have to stop. Okay, yeah. but drinking uh, or tasting is also limited by, by your organism capabilities, right? Because otherwise, you would be finishing job, uh, your, your work, <laughs> yeah. drunk every day if you had 30 samples every day. So is there any kind of limit that you don't go beyond, a line yeah. you cannot trust? Um, that it definitely is legal. For me, it's about thirty glasses of cask strength whiskey. Okay. If I do that, I'm generally I'm getting <laughs> sleepy, you know. Right. Okay. Well, your limits <laughs> different from ours. Uh, when we do say that we taste uh, whiskies, what we actually do is we um, take the sample into our mouth and we spit. So we expect. So you spit. Mm -hmm. uh, and that way, we are consuming far less than if we sipped and, and swallowed. But mm. nonetheless, we are uh, very. So, because I still take in some alcohol, right? Into your bloodstream. Yeah. yeah. So, we're very aware of that, and Diageo has the you know, responsible drinking. We, we are aware of that, and we make uh, sure that we are not approaching anywhere near that limit. Mm -hmm. so, and the way that we do that typically is we work around uh, when the panel work goes out. So, if we know that we're going to be doing a tasting, as well as um, expectorating, we make sure we're not going to be driving, you know, soon after that mm -hmm. uh, session, and we're just aware of the the number of samples that we are assessing mm -hmm. by taste. And mm -hmm. yeah. So what, what would you say if I know I'm, I'm pushing for a number? Yeah. But would you say it's you're not going to get one? Five glasses, eight glasses, three yeah. glasses. I think yeah, f five, six glasses, and you're aware that you've got to stop. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as tasting is concerned, yeah, okay. yeah I would say. I, that's I always say that if you have six, seven, eight, then every whiskey becomes very good. Yeah. Because you feel the alcohol, and, and then the the, the, the the objective judgment is finished. Yeah. Because then you feel the enjoyment from uh, from getting intoxicated. Mm. Okay, and so now I would like to proceed to uh, the difference because in the let's say in the market or in between the the way whiskey is made and the way whiskey is tasted by blenders mm -hmm. and the way it's consumed by the end consumers there is a lot of blurred areas that form misconceptions okay. i heard many many times from consumers that i only drink my whiskey with about 50 percent of water and things like this you nose and taste your whiskey mm -hmm. mostly very diluted is that correct uh, diluted in the sense that we you add water. We add water, uh, demon water, and we add it to reduce the alcohol in the whiskey samples. Mm -hmm. So we could be assessing uh, cask strength whiskies or bottle strength whiskies, but nonetheless, nonetheless, that consistent approach that our blenders take is we usually do it at 20 to 23 percent alcohol in the mm -hmm. glass. Mm -hmm. um, we're very much being uh, looked at as an analytical tool almost, so mm -hmm. you need to be able to detect all these aromas that are going on in the whiskies, and we've found over time that the best practice is to reduce to 20 to 23 mm -hmm. percent alcohol. That, mm -hmm. that lowers the alcohol effect, but it allows the volatile molecules to be more easily perceived. Mm -hmm. Okay. and. This is what you do for nosing and uh, blending, mm -hmm. and uh, as far as consumption is concerned, would you consider such high dilution as something that consumers also, I know, but please don't give me the answer, you know it's very subjective and yeah, it depends true. on personal preferences, yeah. um, I'm talking just about whiskey enjoyment, do you think it should be diluted so much, or maybe the bottle strength is enough? Or how do you perceive this? I'm very interested in this. And again, it's my personal opinion, mm -hmm. because we're talking in a consumer uh, mm -hmm. place now, I think uh, I can enjoy whiskies, both single malts mm -hmm. and blended scotch. I can consume them in different ways and I get different things from them. Mm -hmm. So 
Historically, there was more of uh, an opinion that these whiskies should be drunk with a dash of water, if anything. Mm -hmm. Now we're more open to you consume them the way that you enjoy them best. Mm -hmm. And for me, consumers should be experimenting with what does that mean to you as an individual. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoy Johnny Walker Red Label with cola. And okay, I, I so let, let, let me make a little stop here. This is a okay. very important subject for us because yeah. uh, whenever we say this word, cola, uh, no, cola is okay. But in one sentence, when you say cola and whiskey, yes. it's always a subject of a heated discussion, okay. at least yes, among should. the people around my activities online. Uh -huh. So what you say is that you gave a name of whiskey and a brand, of course, uh, in this case, Johnny Walker Red, uh -huh. but generally a blended whiskey, the general expression, the no way statement, I'm not talking about some very premium ones that spend a lot of time in casks and everything. Uh -huh. It's okay to drink it with, let's say, mixtures, so yeah. cola, juice, 7-Up, Sprite, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. yeah, if you enjoy it that way, uh -huh. there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, and now um, getting getting uh, towards whiskies that are generally not enjoyed this way. So single malts, very premium blends, and things like this. Uh, getting back to adding water, would you add a lot of water to it? Or just a little bit of water, or no water at all? For me personally, it's a little bit of water to, uh -huh. to open up the whiskies. Even at bottle strength. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think... I because mean, bottle strength is already with water, right? It is, yeah. Uh -huh. um, I think, yeah, you could start off sipping it at bottle strength. If that appears to be not working for you, then mm -hmm. a small dash of water. And again, the temperature of the water can mm -hmm. be important. Should be room, room temperature? Uh, either room temperature or if you want that flavour to evolve in your mouth, then a chilled water works too. Chilled. Chilled mm -hmm. water, it, 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 um, the temperature means that the whiskey is very closed, if mm -hmm. you like, and when you take it into your mouth, the heat from your mouth opens it up. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's quite a, a novel experience as well. And again, mm -hmm. it's really very much as a consumer, what do you want that whiskey to deliver to you? How are mm -hmm. you going to enjoy it best? Mm -hmm. And now a question for more, uh, I will ask this on behalf of more advanced uh, whiskey connoisseurs. Uh, I, I have a lot of friends that are of very strong opinion uh -huh. that a cask, well, oh, first of all, they're of opinion that bottle strength is uh, for beginners, only cask strength. Okay. Uh, and there is something to it, I also agree that higher content of alcohol, because there is no dilution, mm -hmm. delivers much more density of the flavor, let me put it this way. Yeah. And I have a lot of friends who, who, who firmly believe that drinking cask strength whiskey is the best form of having whiskey. Of course, sometimes you can add a dash of water or not, depends on you. What's your opinion on this? Is there too much alcohol for you in that, or is that something that you could enjoy as well? I think every whiskey has its place and mm -hmm. its occasion. And for me, it's very much about what mood I'm in and, and you know, what, what is the purpose of drinking the whiskey. Mm -hmm. So I think cask strength whiskies have their place. Um, for me, my preference is to go towards bottled strength whiskies mm -hmm. because for me, it's all about flavour and mm -hmm. it works for me in, in my own mm -hmm. personal setting. Um, for me, the alcohol definitely does have an impact on how you perceive the whiskies, but if these guys and girls enjoy it at cast strength, mm -hmm. then there's nothing not? to say. Yeah, okay, not exactly. now I'll move to the glass that you use because glass is a subject that is very close to my heart as well. Okay. I see that you're using the glasses that uh, uh, are the most reminiscent of the shape of the of the actual tulip yeah. uh, because there is also uh, a shape that uh, has a little bit different goblet I think we, we have it here like yeah. the one that goes like this mm -hmm. do you have any preference in terms of shape of the glass? Again my personal preference because I have worked with that glass shape for so long is mm -hmm. to go with this option uh, the tulip glass with the stem and mm -hmm. and the, my reason so for th that this is kind of looks like a like a port glass, right? Yeah, yeah. Port wine glass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the purpose and the, the, my reasoning for it working for me is it allows me to hold the glass without affecting the, the whiskey that's the whiskey in it. Inside. Um, and you'll see these glasses that we're using at the moment, they are blue glasses uh -huh. and we use them a lot. In so, so you use stained glass or do you use the transparent glass? Uh, we use a mixture of both, uh -huh. each have a part to play. But if we're looking at purely what is the difference between samples uh, and we want that difference to be described by nose or by taste, mm -hmm. then 
we're using these blue glasses takes mm -hmm. away the visual impact. Mm -hmm. So we can have differences in mm -hmm. uh, tint of the mature whiskies, mm -hmm. and we don't want that to influence how people perceive it. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is any difference in the uh, size of the opening of the glass, the glass mouth, or whatever you call it? Yeah. Sure, because this is very narrow, I would say. It is, yeah. It is. That's good for nosing. Yes. Yes. And okay. it, what it does is it focuses all these molecules into mm -hmm. where your nose is at. Mm -hmm. If that opening was much broader, mm -hmm. then you would lose these molecules yes. into that. And so, I already did that with some guys in France with cognac, uh -huh. but can we finally and definitely kill the myth of warming the spirit with your hand. Yeah. Would you ever do something like this? That's why I prefer this glass uh -huh. shape. As it because you use the stem to distance yourself exactly. from the whiskey. Yeah, yeah. You don't affect it with the warmth of your, of your exactly. hand. Cool. Uh, and uh, how do you feel about the... Because in Poland there's a lot of people who support the uh, cognac glass. I'm sure you know what it is, the, the, the big sphere, so like the sphere tongue, glass. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that something you would ever use for nosing? I think this shape works perfectly uh -huh. for what we require at the moment, so I'd, I'd be tempted to stick with that one. We'll stick with that yeah. one. Okay. Um, now I would like to ask you a few questions about your daily work. Okay. Um, we are um, also very interested, I say we because I speak also on behalf and in the name of people who watch me in Poland, so mm -hmm. hi to everyone in Poland. Hi. Uh, and, uh, I would like to know a little bit more uh, about the uh, general composition of the blended whiskey. We all know it's composed of two main components, which is the grain whiskey and the malt whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I would like to know a little bit more about uh, what is the proportion, of, I mean, what is, it's probably different in different, uh, different kinds of uh, blended whiskey, yeah. but uh, what does it mean that there is more malt or less malt? What, what is brought in by grain whiskey? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the qualities of grain whiskey? I very often, um, I very often encounter the perception that if there is more grain whiskey, uh, then the whiskey is worse. Mm -hmm. And so, to some extent, this is logical. I also think this is logical because malt whiskey is more expensive to produce. Mm -hmm. uh, so for there is also a lot of cheap whiskeys on the market that you can buy for peanuts, mm -hmm. and then they are very alcoholic. They are not maybe very. Uh, there is not so much craftsmanship <laughs> in the flavor, I would say, in some products. So, how does this work? Uh, what's, what's brought by grain? What's brought by malt? Yeah, good question. Also uh, a difficult one and complex, probably. Uh, we could talk about it for a long time. But yeah, yeah. Um, I think each whiskey plays its part mm -hmm. in uh, the world of scotch. So, you, quite rightly, you said blended scotch is made up of various grain whiskies and in addition to that, various malt whiskies. Mm -hmm. The theory or the, the, the feeling that you're getting about uh, grain whiskies being inferior is definitely not the case from mm -hmm. a blender's perspective. In fact, we couldn't come up with any blended scotch options without grain whiskey being in there. Mm -hmm. And for me, the, the style of grain whiskies generically are very different to the flavour styles that you get across our malt mm -hmm. portfolio. Um, grain whiskies are light and typically quite sweet and rounded and mellow in flavour styles. And that comes through by nose as well. Uh, we bottle a single grain offering called Hague Club mm -hmm. and the distillery character and the cask influence mm -hmm. is very well balanced in that whiskey and throughout the grain whiskey maturation process it is um, more likely to take on the influence of the cask mm -hmm. so for example you say more likely than malt um i think because the distillery character is quite light in the first instance mm -hmm. it will take on the character and influence from the cask Mm -hmm. And that can happen in malt whiskey maturation too. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we have the grain whiskey and that usually is the starting point for me as mm -hmm. a blender if I'm mm -hmm. crafting something new. When I get the core of that blend, that being the grain whiskey correct, then I'll start to add malt whiskies on top of that. Mm -hmm. And that adds complexity and it adds more intense flavour styles. So mm -hmm. you've got to be very careful as a blender that you're getting that balance right. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, when we talk about adding smoky whiskies or peaty whiskies to the, the blend, 
these are very intense flavours, so yes. we've got to be very careful with the amounts that we add because mm-hmm. a, a little goes a very long way. Mm-hmm. And uh, could you explain how important or unimportant, I, I already know important from what you said, mm-hmm. um, is the uh, peat whiskey yeah. uh, in, the bla- in the blend? Uh-huh. Because usually it's, I mean, there are not so many smoky blends out there. I mean, there are a few, of course, mm-hmm. uh, but mostly the, the, the most important expressions of the blends of all brands and also John Walker Red is not a typically smoky. Uh, whiskey is it? Yeah. But you add some smoky whiskey to it. Yes, we do. So, what is its role? For me, it uh, can be different, and you, it, it depends on the extremes and how how many of these smoky whiskies you add, and and you've cottoned on to that already. Uh, so, the final flavour style of the blend very much dictates how much of these smoky whiskies you put mm-hmm. in. If it's a minimal amount of smoke, it may not even be perceived as smoke mm-hmm. in the final blend, but it gives a depth of character for me. That, that's what I wanted to, I, did, I don't know yeah. maybe how to phrase it, but that's what yeah. I wanted to ask. So you add smoky whiskies uh-huh. to create some character that might not even be manifested in the flavour profile. It might not be perceived as mm-hmm. smoke, but nonetheless it is mm-hmm. there. And then you have other blends that have more volume of these smoky whiskies mm-hmm. gone into them. And at that point, you and the consumers would appreciate the smoky character coming through and it is very important that we as blenders get that balance right because Mm -hmm. you do not necessarily want these smoky characteristics to swamp the flavour of the the whole blend. Mm -hmm. You want it to play a part and it needs to be married properly in Mm -hmm. that uh, you know, a consumer would describe them as being smoky, but mm-hmm. there are other flavours in there to support it. Mm-hmm. So it's all about the ba- balance of the flavours uh, and crafting something that a consumer is going to adore at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Okay, there are so many questions I want to ask you. I could stay for a week. Uh-huh. Uh, okay, so speaking of malts, uh, mm-hmm. there are of course different type of, uh, types of smokiness in malts, different, uh, I would say, maybe levels of intensity. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you use the smoky whiskies? Because I think your main volume smoky whiskey is Kalila, yeah. uh, and then you also have the magnificent and famous. Uh, we, we were laughing before that uh, uh, some people want to call it in, almost like in French, La <laughs> But uh, I'm speaking, of course, of the La Gavoule in the yeah. story, uh, on Isla yeah. also. Uh, how do you use them, and which ones are your favorite, mo- most important ones? Uh, and we also have Talisker on yes. the Isle of Sky. Sky um, yes. They're all on the west coast of Scotland. And uh, yeah, they use peat in the drying process, and mm-hmm. that carries all the way through the distillation into the cask and eventually as mature whiskey. Um, they do have single malt offerings from each of these individual malt whiskey distilleries, so that's critically important. Mm-hmm. And then we produce sufficient to be used in our blended scotches as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I think. Each of them, although they come under the umbrella of smoky peaty whiskies, mm-hmm. they all have different flavours that mm-hmm. support them as well. And so if you had to have these three glasses alongside each so other... It would be easy to tell them apart, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when it comes to blended scotch, we've got a... Particularly if it's new innovation and a, a new whisky blend, it's very much down to our... Um, when is it available in the first place? Do we have it in our stock, in our inventory? And mm-hmm. it's about crafting the flavour styles that we're after in the final blend. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's about making these judgment calls as blenders. Mm-hmm. You touched upon a, a very interesting subject, because when you make a blend, mm. you cannot always guarantee that you have 100 casks of this, 25 casks of that, yeah. and it's always the same age, and the, and the exactly. flavour profile is always the same. Mm. So. If you, if you make a blend, does it go more according to a recipe mm-hmm. or does it come more that there is a lot of roads to lead to one place? So you can substitute one whiskey with another one to get a similar effect. Good question. Um, and I can share a bit of that. We do have recipes for all our blends mm-hmm. and we, we for, for consistency of mm-hmm. quality... We can need you to send me the recipes process. by email? I will do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then I'll give up my job. <laughs> um, so yeah, each and then... That would be every, almost like espionage, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can't go there. Uh, so each blend has its own recipe. Mm-hmm. And we stick to that in terms of making sure that each blend rotation 
is consistent in quality and so what the consumer gets is a consistent blended scotch. So that happens but there are occasions where we can substitute one single malt with another and it will not upset the final blend mm -hmm. character. That is the critically important bit mm -hmm. as a blender that we ensure what a consumer is getting is what they expect if mm -hmm. they're an adorer. If they're a, an adopter, we want to set that benchmark mm -hmm. in terms of flavour as to what they can expect mm -hmm. every day that they taste it from there on in. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's the important thing. So you could you could probably use different single malts, but you have a lot on offer, right? Because yeah, yeah. you have how many distilleries? Is it 29, 28? 20, 28, 28 malt distilleries. 28 malt distilleries. And we have about of 10 million casks in our maturing okay. inventory. So okay. we're very lucky, we're fortunate. You do have a lot of that's true. That's from. true. Yeah. So you could substitute a mold to a mold if the profile is similar. Yes. And then using your senses, using your nose, work around it to make sure the profile is similar. Exactly. Okay. And now I have a question that's also important, uh, and it's coming straight from the market. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't necessarily apply to any given brand, but very often I hear it about different brands, also about Johnny Walker that. All it's changed recently, all is different. I drank into the 1990s, it was different. Yeah. I drink it now, it's different, and so on. Yeah. Uh, and of course, this is obvious that to some extent this is true. If you drink a whiskey expression from 20 years ago, it is different. Yeah. And so, however, the, the general idea or concept of the whiskey is similar. If it's fruity and sweet, it's fruity and sweet. It's never smoky. Yeah. But uh, question on the consistency. Yeah. Uh, of course, it is impossible to keep it 100% the same at all times in all bottlings and everything. But how consistent do you feel the bottlings are of blended whiskey? It's, it's our role as blenders that mm -hmm. we are uh, custodians of the blend quality. Mm -hmm. So it's very much a focus of what we are a expected keeper. to do. Mm -hmm. yeah, is make sure that the, the product, uh, whether it be Johnny Walker Black Label or another blended scotch in our portfolio, we have to keep that consistent mm -hmm. in flavour style. Uh, and we pay a lot of attention to detail to, to make sure that that happens. Um, but nonetheless, we acknowledge that the whisky making process is very much a natural process. And when it comes to filling our new make spirit into casks, these casks might all be the same cask style. For example, mm -hmm. they're all American oak, uh, but nonetheless, they're a natural product. And mm -hmm. so what we do get is batch to batch variation, mm -hmm. but that is carefully managed and carefully controlled. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the lend learning of the blenders is to know what that small variation is like mm -hmm. and to know more importantly, when it goes beyond that acceptable batch-to-batch mm -hmm. -batch variation. Um, and we manage that whole process. Mm -hmm. So my expectation and my belief in my heart is that each blend is consistent from one batch that is mm -hmm. made to the next batch. Mm -hmm. And that's where our effort is focused, mm -hmm. is to make sure that happens. Okay. And now a question. I get this question asked a lot. Uh, I answer according to what I feel or assume, but I cannot know because I'm not involved in the process. But uh, I get a lot of people, and this is, uh, this is uh, I would say also it's underlined by suspicion. Um, is it possible that in different distribution channels or on different markets, uh -huh. uh, the same blend, let's say Johnny Walker Red, is different? No. No. All of our blends for our scotches, whether they're single malt offerings or blended scotch, they will go through a process whereby we oversee them. And with the, mm -hmm. there is one recipe for Johnny Walker Red Label, no matter where they, mm -hmm. it will eventually end up. So there is no such thing that when it uh, appears on a shelf of a cheaper supermarket chain or whatever, it's of inferior quality. There is no such thing. Not if it is genuine Johnny Walker Red mm -hmm. Label in the bottle, mm -hmm. in that branded bottle, and it's mm -hmm. the right liquid. And uh, do you get counterfeits? Uh, we can come across them, yeah. Um, it's mm -hmm. not an area that I focus on, but mm -hmm. I certainly get involved in any customer concern samples or any mm -hmm. potential counterfeits that come back to Okay, so you also examine things that could be, them could be faked yeah. Johnny Walker, and it happens. 
It can okay. happen. Uh, recently, I think um, a friend of mine came back from Egypt, I think, uh -huh. and uh, he brought a bottle that uh, it looked like Shivas Regal. Mm -hmm. It was named Grand, almost like Grand, and it had a walking gentleman. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's a, <laughs> so a, a very big vision <laughs> of a blend of a blend yes, of a blend. So uh, things happen, uh, but this is of course this is ridiculous uh, um, example of you know some, yeah. somebody probably letting imagination maybe go yes. too much and too wild. Uh, but you could get something in some markets that. Uh, People, I don't know, in some some way recollect the original bottles and fill them with something that's not in whiskey. Does it happen in the world? Uh, again, I'm, I'm not close enough to comment and give you any kind of factual okay. information mm -hmm. on that, but I do. it definitely goes on. Okay. Uh, our job mm -hmm. is to ensure as best as we can that mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, now one of the last questions I have is... Uh, uh, related to uh, also to blending because I don't know the specific number but I, I believe you sell one bottle of John Walker per second worldwide or something like this or two bottles or like, uh, that's immense amount and yeah. uh, this is of course absolutely I think I don't know you tell me in a second absolutely impossible that you go and taste every cask that is involved yeah. in vatting yeah. because there's just so many casks you have to be drunk That's all day 24-7 yeah. uh, all year round yeah. so how do you manage this Are, because there's uh, there's the head of your team this uh -huh. is uh, Mr. Beveridge yeah. and then there's 12 of you the blenders yeah. so there's 13 people involved uh -huh. and sometimes you have to spend time with people like me who come over and ask some <laughs> you know weird questions yeah. coming out of the like, hey, come on <laughs> yeah. and uh, so can to what extent to, to what part of spirit is actually nosed and tested by you yeah. is your nose one of the blenders in every cast or in every hundred casks in every ten casks yeah. or how does it work yeah, you've, you've picked up on that and it's a really good point. Um, Diageo has a very stringent quality assurance and quality control process in place. And we as blenders are actually involved from the new make spirit point of view. So we connect with that whole quality making, uh, quality whisky making process from the new make spirit point mm -hmm. in the supply chain. So we do routinely nose New Make Spirit samples and make sure that what they are producing at the distilleries will be fit for purpose for the blends in the fullness of time. Mm -hmm. We then um, sample our maturing cask uh, whiskies, mm -hmm. and so even before they are called Scotch whisky, which is three years in a cask, we are sampling and doing cask audits on the maturing samples mm -hmm. with a view to being ahead of the game if there's any issues there mm -hmm. in terms of quality. Can you possibly predict that, for instance, you're nosing a malt that's 8 years old, 7 years old, 12 years old, yeah. whatever, mm -hmm. can you possibly predict what will happen with that particular cask in 5 years, 8 years, 25 years? Yeah, I think that definitely comes with time. Uh -huh. uh, and there may be an occasion where we get it slightly wrong, but we are exposed to so mm -hmm. many samples, that is our daily job, mm -hmm. is to understand how the cask influences the aroma and the flavour of the mm -hmm. maturing whiskies. So you could say something like this, like this one needs sherry cask, or this one should not go anymore because it's I don't know, too woody or something like this. Yeah, this could happen. That is you part of the like cask that. auditing process mm -hmm. that we're involved in. We're all, we all play a part in that. Mm -hmm. And then when a blend has been disgorged at uh, our disgorging unit, we won't be there physically but we get samples to make sure that that quality is within specification mm -hmm. so that's at the point of it being cask strength mm -hmm. blended scotch then the next stage in the supply chain is to move that whiskey to one of our bottling sites mm -hmm. either at leaven or at shield hall mm -hmm. and again we can become involved in that whiskey checking mm -hmm. process now we do invest quite a bit of our time to, mm -hmm. to train people at these sites so that we give the responsibility to mm -hmm. them to highlight if there's any So, so the blenders concerns. have also among the staff of the slurries like pre-blenders, people who... We've got people along the supply into, chain yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, to look out for mm -hmm. the quality. Mm -hmm. And so we are almost there because okay, we know how to nose now, we know how to blend more or less. We know that the products, uh, we are very close to the product. I wanted to ask you one last question about the scale. You know, imagine you're in the kitchen, you have a recipe. Yeah. You add a glass of flour, you add a glass of milk, three eggs, whatever. Yeah. You make some kind of dough or a, pan, or a cake, whatever. Yeah. 
we make Johnny Walker now. And like we need to provide Johnny Walker for next month or a quarter or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, blenders provide recipe. Yep. And your recipe, what would it say? Add 100 casks of, I don't know, Cardu mm -hmm. and 25 casks of Kalila? Or yeah. how would it look like and what would be the scale? Yeah. I think the scale, you've got to recognise that it has to be versatile. So mm -hmm. there are opportunities whereby we, we blend very small volumes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that could be, you know, two, three casts worth of Scotch whisky going together to make a final blend. But you're right, the scale has to be pretty flexible. And for some of our blended Scotch offerings, we could be talking about multiple tanker loads being one blend. So mm -hmm. it's hundreds of casts that we're talking about. But nonetheless, we still pay attention to the quality and that attention to detail to make sure that what the consumer mm -hmm. gets is right. So is then important. if you say that you need, uh, let's say, 200 casks of a five-year-old malt or four-year-old malt, yeah. uh, in that respect, do you have to know one of them, five of them, or can you trust, uh, let's say, the distillery manager who was trained in, uh, uh, in sensory analysis for his particular malt, could you trust his judgment? Or how does it work? It's, it's a bit of both. We Both. support each other. Okay. So the blenders at the end of the day are responsible for the blend quality, but we have people <laughs> that we have trained and mm -hmm. we recognise the So they would say, quality. we think the quality is good, we think we have the profile you look for, yeah. or they might say, we think we have a profile that you need to check to make sure. Yeah. All of mm -hmm. these things can happen, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, mm -hmm. the bottled product needs to be overseen by us and mm -hmm. we are very close at all these stages along the supply mm -hmm. chain. In the other room, I showed the uh, the bottle of uh, John Walker Diamond Jubilee yeah. for Queen Elizabeth, uh -huh. and uh, it's uh, uh, it's an expression, a bottling that only has sixty bottles, mm -hmm. so that that's not even a cask. No. And uh, I imagine that this is very easy to make because you can make it probably on one table in laboratory, yeah. sixty yeah. bottles as well, forty something like this. Yeah. Um, and uh, there are some other expressions of uh, even Johnny Walker, like the blue label mm -hmm. uh, or some other ones that are that are much 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 more limited yeah. so here the scale is of course uh, incom incomparably yeah. lower yeah yeah uh -huh. it, it usually is and if, if it is um, you know a prestige blend for example mm -hmm. and we're pulling out uh, what makes it special it can be because the distillery is now closed and there's a finite volume of that mature mm -hmm. whiskey in our stocks so yeah um, you know, the, the, the higher the level of the whiskey in terms of consumer expectations, then it can mean there is smaller volume of that. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, the, the requirements of the blenders to oversee the quality is still exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So that is important that although we do do things at scale, mm -hmm. which are big volumes, we still get involved and sign off the end quality of the, the, the whiskey that the consumer is going to Mm -hmm. Adore mm -hmm. and enjoy. And is there any John Walker expression or blend uh, that you're particularly involved in? I know that recently you had um, one that is related to Game of Thrones yeah, yeah. and you released it. Yeah. Um, you have the one, uh, I said the Diamond Jubilee, yeah. and there are also some other ones. Yeah. Uh, you have now the Blenders Batch, right? Exactly. Is that yeah. something that's close to the heart of your team? Yeah, or? it definitely is. They all um, come from within our blending team. Mm -hmm. So whether it is an ongoing uh, blend like Johnny Walker Red or Johnny Walker Black, or something that is more a uh, one-off limited edition. Anything for Johnny Walker comes through the blending team here in mm -hmm. mainstream. Mm -hmm. So we all get an opportunity to play a part. It might be that we don't get involved in crafting the new blend, but nonetheless our noses will be involved mm -hmm. in evaluating it. And as far as the last question, last question yeah. but two parts of it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask about your favorite distilleries of malt whiskey. Yeah. Uh, and favorite uh, PD one, and favorite uh, floral Swedish dessert one. Okay. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, we are very spoiled for choice because we have so, have many, yeah. so many malt distilleries uh -huh. and so many offerings from them. Um, and again, it depends very much on you know when I'm going to be consuming, what do I want from it, how do I want to enjoy it. Uh -huh. um, but for me, the, the standouts for me are. It's a it's a struggle between T and N for me uh, as a single mom. You know, <laughs> it's very funny because you, you I think you deliberately choose the ones that are impossible to pronounce. Yeah. Tin and Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And the other one is Kleinlich, which Kleinlich, is the okay. most northerly uh, mom. Yeah. yeah. 
And so these are two favourites of mine. Uh -huh. uh, Would you ever trade casks with other uh, distilleries or you don't have to? Uh, I think, yeah, that's definitely something that goes on. Uh -huh. uh, but nonetheless, we, we, we're we spoiled again. With right. You have the portfolio to choose. So, so how about the smoky one? The smoky one for me is definitely Lagavulin. Lagavulin. Uh, for me, Lagavulin, 16-year-old, has that smokiness, obviously, mm -hmm. but it has an inherent sweetness and just it's it's very intense in flavour. But the, the wood has done its job properly, mm -hmm. the cask, and it's very mellow and for a... For a really highly peated whisky, for me it's quite approachable, mm -hmm. but others might so, say something different. So here to sum up and conclude, I can say that great minds think alike. Uh -huh. uh, of course, I'm yeah, a little bit kidding, but uh, also for myself, Kleinlich and Lagavulin, of course, with mm -hmm. the combination of peat and sherry, are mm -hmm. among my personal favorites as well. Good. So yeah. maybe I'm going the right way yeah. for uh, for uh, flavor. Enjoying the blend. Yes. No, we'll see about <laughs> that. Uh, but uh, definitely, it is uh, very interesting to learn uh, about what you did work. Yeah. Thank you very much for this interesting yeah. conversation, uh, and I am very happy. I cannot even say, tell you how happy I am about the insights that you gave to us, uh -huh. because some of the things that you said are very important to. Uh, education uh, and to letting consumers know how whiskey should be uh, enjoyed. So thank you very much once thank again. You. Thank, you. thank you. 